Thank you, John. Ooh, right. Susie, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, just by way of introduction, I, I am, as John said, I'm Lee from uh, Travolution, which is the global media partner for the Travel Forward event this year. We're delighted to be so. Uh, and Susie is from Living Bridge. Just give us a quick overview of what Living Bridge is first. For all of you who probably don't know, and that's, that's probably good. Um, so Living Bridge is a private equity investment firm. So we've been around for over 25 years. Um, so hopefully we've learned a few things along the way. Um, we split that into three funds. So we have um, a group who do what we call growth stage investing. So this is writing equity checks of between half a million and five million pounds, usually into very young businesses um, looking for kind of very high growth returns. And then we've got an enterprise fund which invests between five and 25 million pounds. And then we have a mid-market fund which does investments of 25 to 100 million pounds. So why does that matter at all? What matters is you know, whether you're looking for half a million quid or 100 million quid, we've got a pocket to fund it from and uh, a yeah. lot of investments in travel. Why are they split like that? That's probably a technical sort of capital reason, but just explain yeah. why, why you have that split. No, no, absolutely. So the, the returns profile of the three different funds will be quite different because yeah. obviously in younger, earlier stage businesses, you get some smash out the park winners, but you get some not so great close the doors, thank you. Um, and so just the blended return profile looks different. So the people we're investing on behalf of, they will choose sort of where their risk profile is and therefore the type of return they want. Yeah. Um, so yeah. so, so you, you've got some, you know, really very impressive um, previous business, you've businesses that you've invested in and some current ones. Um, Thank you very much. Let's, let's just talk about a few because, you know, there's, they've got some amazing stories behind them. I think On the Beach is probably one that most people will know in the, if you're in the UK and the OTA space. Yep. Uh, now they, they went through to a second private equity owner and then they um, have since floated. floated. Yep. Um, but you were in there from quite an early stage, weren't you? Yeah. Um, I can't remember the exact dates, but I think no. it was 2007, if I remember correctly. Yep. Um, yeah. So it was notes, sort of that's correct. very, very early stage. Um, they were still really figuring out what they wanted to do, and this was at a time where, you know, it sounds crazy now, but uh, buying your holidays online and your summer beach holiday, it just wasn't so much of a thing. Um, and one of the partners I worked with, a guy called Dan, you know, really backed the team. Well, I say the team was a very under, underdeveloped team at the time, but backed the management's vision for, look, this is the way we're going to be doing it in the future, and here's, here's my kind of head start in what we're doing. And we really worked with him to build a team around him. So that was around bringing in kind of some technical support around him, some broader management team. So a lot of the time we back incredible entrepreneurs who might be, you know, one or, or, or a couple of, of people, but actually to really go to the next level, they need to start building a bench behind them. Yeah. And that then goes all the way through. As you say, we sold it on to another private equity firm who then, you know, built the business even more and then floated it on the stock market. And that whole journey was around building a team that then could kind of outlive us. You know, we always talk about the businesses we back. We hope that by the time we do move on, uh, we leave the business in better shape than when, when yeah. we invested and it yeah. continues to excel without us. And si Simon, the founder of yep. On The Beach, we, we, know, we know quite well. Um, you know, he started this business in his front room, I think it was. Correct. In the terrace yeah. house in Manchester. Exactly so. Um, and, um, you know, he's grown it to an incredible state. Did, did you just see that potential in that business? Yeah. And what was it that made you think this has got the potential to, to go to where it's got to today? Yeah, no, I mean, so as you say, it, it's not entirely uncommon for the, the businesses that we back to be, you know, not quite kitchen table businesses, but not actually that far from it. Um, I think things that were really clear about that business is, is the momentum he managed to get. Um, and actually doing something that hadn't really been done before and yet was getting such good adoption so quickly. Um, so I think things that you see, and you'll look at this across all of our portfolio companies, it's, you know, the, the customer speaks with their pounds. That's yeah. always the, the easiest way to tell if you've got something that's working is if, you know, unsolicited customers are, are engaging and then engaging again. So repeat rates is another really good leading indicator. Um, if they're not having to buy their customer through discounts, but actually just through a great proposition and a great user experience, another really good indicator. Um, but I'd say above all, a, a, a founder who is obsessed about this. And you know, sometimes that obsession can mean that they are blind to certain things. They're not specific to Simon, but they're, they're, you know, they're so tunnel visioned about the, the vision and where they're going that they don't see things. And again, that's where as, as financial sponsors, our job is to come in and say, you're awesome at this, but let's think about this, you know, headwind that perhaps you haven't thought about. Let's build a team around you who can help you think more roundedly. 
but actually founders who are single-minded about what they're doing is, is a huge part of it, which, mm. you know, when we invested in Love Holidays, it was exactly the same echo, so. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, no, well, no. Yeah, well, we're coming Sorry, to Love Holidays. Sorry, jumping ahead. <laughs> lo, lo, yeah, Love Holidays is, is, is probably your latest travel acquisition, isn't uh, it? Yes, yeah, yes. We'll come on to that in a minute, but let's, let's, not, let's move. Sorry. Let's stay in, let's stay in Manchester, because it's obviously a lucky city for you, because you got on the beach, which is Manchester-based, but another big one was Travel Jigsaw, which yep. became rental cars. Yep. And it's an absolutely line. enormous business. I mean, it's actually yeah. under the radar, really, but it's a real big, big UK success story. Absolutely. Uh, again, the story of how you became invest, invested in them and what, what, again, did you see that they have that you um, thought was worth well, backing? Common denominator, so Greg, similarly. Greg Wills, the, he's a founder. Yeah. Exactly, single-minded entrepreneur, had a really clear vision for what the opportunity was, what the proposition for sort of all, all, all participants in, in, in the space could be. Um, and then was just absolutely single-minded about what he was going to build, how he was going to build it. And I think, again, actually, was almost sort of outsized in his ambition, almost to the point where I think we probably said, okay, not, not sure we're quite going to get there, but, you know, really see the potential in what you're doing. And, you know, Greg's a great example of someone that we backed, helped him build out the team, really further proposition and said, we ended up selling it to Priceline. And actually, we continue to work with Greg and all of his team, so his CTO, CMO, they're sort of part of our broader family, so they co-invest with us inside um, some of the other deals that we've done. Okay. Yeah. And that, that is about leveraging sort of the connect, collective knowledge of, of what we've done before to try and bring as much as we can to the businesses we back. Um, as I said, at the end of the day, maybe you won't all feel this in the room, but capital's not really the scarce commodity. If you've got a good idea, you won't be short of people who want to fund you. So really it's about how do we at Living Bridge go and say, look, we've done a load of things, we've learned a lot of stuff, we have access to some people who could be quite helpful, you tell us what you need, we'll help you solve those problems. Yeah. And, and clearly you've developed a specialism in, in travel, you've got that yep. heritage of yep, backing yep. Big travel, good travel companies and success stories. So does that help when you're talking to people who are looking for, because they're probably nervous about who they're going to be selling to and who they're going to be begin yeah. to their business? It's their baby and they don't want to uh, see it um, change too much, I guess. So does it help that you've got those stories now in the back to say, well, look, this is what we've done with these guys? Yeah, I mean, I think it helps. So it's a good question because I think it helps from a couple of angles. First of all, you, you, you just, you, you kind of know what good looks like. And similarly, the entrepreneur can smell on you that you, you know, ask the right questions, you use the right language, you understand the key kind of bottlenecks and, and growth opportunities and actually, a founder and a business owner, that's what they want. They want someone who gets it. They get all the ugly, difficult bits. They understand how difficult, you know, working with the CAA can be or, you know, such things, um, which you don't get with generalist investors who maybe haven't got that record. So there's, there's a familiarity piece. There is the ability for me to say, you know, go speak to Greg. He'll tell you what it's like to work with us or, you know, Simon or anyone else. So, so there's just the go fact check the reality of what it's like working with us. And then, as you say, there's a sort of the, the numbers track record bit. But I don't know, in my opinion, I actually think that's kind of, you know, the making money bit is really important, but actually building businesses with entrepreneurs who we're still friends with at the end, yeah. that's what yeah. you build a franchise off. Yeah, okay. So you mentioned Love, love Holidays. Did, yep. did, was, was that a factor in that? You know, love Holidays were looking at you and thinking, well, they've done, they've done it for on the beach. You know, yeah. surely they can come and do it for us. And I know, I know there, was, there was interest in, in the holidays more beyond you guys. There was, a, there was an auction and the Slightly price went up as a result. Is that, is that, yes. is that correct? Yes. And they ended up going for 180 million, which is a, which is a good, good price for a company that's, what, five years old, was it? Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, so Love Holidays was very much um, a kind of what we called a core living bridge deal in terms of, you know, online OTA, but kind of, completely reinventing how customers explore and discover and purchase. And again, it sort of had echoes of what we saw in the on the beach experience of just, it, you know, it was a different, a different proposition, but that same kind of delight and surprise for the customer. Um, and yeah, so when, when we saw it, we were very familiar. We sort of thought 10 years later, go again. We understand what, what we've got, but we also understand how the world has evolved in those 10 years because we've owned assets during that time and we understand kind of what, what the opportunity now looks like. Um, as you say, it was a very competitive process. Um, Al, the CEO, had known a number of us at Living Bridge for a number of years. So again, you know, anyone can put on a good show and a smile for a couple of dinners and a couple of meetings. But my top recommendation is anyone you take investment with, the longer you've known them, the better. Ideally, if they've seen you 
fall on your face a few times and make some mistakes even better because then you really know what you're working with on both sides. I, I want to work with entrepreneurs that have tried things and failed, but they've got up and gone again. I mean, that's, that's, how, you, that's how you iterate. That's how you yeah. improve. But similarly, entrepreneurs want to know that we're not going to be awful and point fingers when yeah. stuff inevitably goes wrong because yeah. it does. Yeah. That's trading. And I know we, when we spoke before, you, you talked about going into a company like Love Holidays, and despite what they've done, they've grown quickly, you can immediately see some quick wins from what you've done in the past. Yeah. That, that, and you've seen that with Love Holidays, how you can take something that they just currently know they should do but haven't been doing, and you can help them accelerate that. Is that, is that what they're looking for from you to yeah. accelerate growth? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think that was... I get back to this point around capital's not the scarce commodity. So it's sort of like, you know, what can you do for us was, was sort of the the question yeah. um, and we have so at Living Bridge we have people who do nothing but work with our portfolio companies on customer acquisitions so they do very deep data analysis around all sorts of micro segmentation of all your customer cohorts across all different lifetime value tracks you know every single PPC arbitrage you can think of we will you know evaluate and that comes from a team um, who used to work for one of the big online car aggregators. So they know it firsthand, sort of how brutally thin the margins in that space are and how on it you have to be. And so to your point, what happened is when we did our diligence, we found a couple areas where despite the fact that Love Holidays had built this amazing tech stack and a really interesting customer journey, there were just some easy wins that we thought they could do. And what was interesting is we presented it to the team and they went, yeah, 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 we, we know, we just haven't got to it. And yeah. we've been growing so quickly that we haven't had to. But as an investor, that's a great thing to go into investment and say, not only are you growing massively month over month, hugely year over year, but there's actually all this stuff that day one, we can come in, help you turn on and go everyone yes. wins. Was it, was it important that Love Holidays wasn't just a sort of on the beach again, there was something different and unique about it that it yeah. was just repl replicating what you'd done previously? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, and, and some things remain constant. So, you know, <clears throat> great customer experience, um, you know, lovely UX, all, all of that is the same, but industries evolve. And again, all you guys know this better than, than I do, that if you, if you aren't constantly looking for what the next thing is, then, then you, you don't improve and it, you know, on the beach was incredibly and is still incredibly innovative. Um, we felt that Love Holidays in their, their sort of discovery search um, engine in terms of what that means is you can have a kind of non-linear search pattern, a more less specific, more um, exploring journey in terms of what you wanna, where you want to go on holiday. So you can say, you know, I want to go somewhere hot in June that has a kids club and a five-star hotel and a gym and air conditioning show me some suggestions, which was much more akin to the conversation that you might have had 30 years ago when you went to your travel agent and said, inspire me. Yeah. Um, so it was a kind of, as you say, it was an evolution, but actually, you know, the one, another way, it was almost a cycle. So I yeah. think it has to be different, it has to move forward, but there were always kind of common themes at the same time. Yeah. What, what those two companies also is similar is that when in their early days, and both said this, I think, we've, we've, we speak to them quite regularly, they always, they both said that when they were starting out, they wanted to keep under the radar slightly. They, they, yeah. they felt they had a bit of secret sauce or something that they were doing differently, and they didn't want everyone to know about it because everyone would copy it. So they spent a lot of time, I think, early in the early days, not really talking about what they did. Yep. But of course, at the point at which they need to get some investment, that they need that kind of noise about them. Is that, that's important, is it, that you can see that there's been a bit of noise about them in the trade, or um, do, would you like to keep to, you found something that no one else has discovered before. You yeah, know. I mean, we love to find the great deal that no one's seen, but yeah. sadly, it doesn't happen that often. Um, I think we look at um, kind of more data-led rather than headline-led. So, you know, there are some businesses that have talk a great game and they have great press, but they, the sort of underlying KPIs aren't really there. Um, but we do all sorts of, you know, analysis. We do a lot of sentiment analysis. So, again, before we went in, you know, to the pitch process with... Al and the team, we'd done a huge sentiment analysis of every TripAdvisor review, every Google review, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. So we kind of knew where the groundswell was in terms of recurring points of feedback, plus and minus. Um, but we could see momentum behind a lot of, of their sort of leading indicators. Yeah. And it's that that you really pay attention to, um, so, I would uh, say. So you, said, you mentioned about being, being data-led. Another, another of your investments has been Sykes Cottages. And I, I, know, yes. I, know, I know those guys when I've seen them talk about their business, they've been incredibly impressive on their data. I mean, they're a smaller company compared to some of their competitors. Yep. They're also in that Airbnb kind of space somewhat. 
Um, but they re they, I get the impression they really do know their business. They've got the data down absolutely perfectly. So w was that one of the attractions for Sykes Cottages that um, yeah. brought you to that company? Yeah, I mean, uh, you're, you're right. They are incredibly data savvy. I mean, I would, I would say, you know, I, I always talk about, I don't think technology is a sector anymore. Technology sits below every business, or it certainly should to a greater or lesser degree. And I think the same is true of data. Um, and you know, within our portfolio of travel companies, but also more broadly, the use of data has just become table stakes. And again, as entrepreneurs, if you want to get the maximum value for your business today from someone like me, the more data you can have to evidence some of your qualitative claims. So you know, our customers say this, we feel that, if you can evidence it with data, then you, you, you just extract more value from, from someone like me. And then similarly with the customer proposition, you know, consumer expectations for, for what they will and won't accept have just evolved so quickly. Yep. Um, and you know, Sykes were just really early to kind of figure out how they could, you know, everything from yield management and pricing through to you know, what, what their um, hosts and, and visitors cared about yeah. and actually sort of engineering the whole proposition around that yeah. to really create a, so a great asset. Been, they're one of those businesses with, with two customers. The, the, Correct. The consumer, and they've got to keep, they don't own the property or the product, they've got to keep those guys happy as well. Correct. So I know they've, they're, they're very keen on doing those two things, which is, yeah, yeah. And which is tough, actually. Completely, and they're very clever around how they sort of merchandise the assortment of their cottages and how they rank different things. You know, Airbnb have sort of set a precedent in terms of uh, more visits, more ratings, you go to the top. But actually, when you've got some cottage owners who might want to only rent out their cottage for a certain period over the summer, if you apply that KPI, they get and dropped to the top. bottom and then yeah. they are, you know, dissatisfied as a customer. So going right back to that, what what is my proposition to the customer? Customer being the person who stays, customer being the, the cottage owner. What, what is my promise to them? And actually, if you get that right, what's interesting, if, if you get that right for that person who wants to only rent out their cottage for X weeks over the summer, they're actually much more price insensitive than you would imagine. It's just do what I'm asking you to do and do it well, make sure no one damages the cottage and you know, it's a slick experience. You don't find them arguing on the margin. Yeah. So it's, sort of, it's worth it getting it right. One of the things you hear, whenever a, uh, an entrepreneur talks about selling their business or getting to the stage of getting investment, it, it's such a labor-intensive process for them as, a, as yeah. an individual. And you know, so you've got someone like a Simon or an Alex at Love Holidays, and they have been totally focused on running the business to the point at which they want to find investment, and then they suddenly find themselves taken out of that entirely. Yeah? yeah. I mean, that hap you know, it does happen. And, and they've got to then keep the business running. So it, it's obviously key for a, an owner to have a great team that can carry on business, business as usual while they get pulled and pushed all over the place. Yep. Um, and, and the, the process seems extremely complicated. Is that, is that, I mean, it could take a year more yeah. to, to, to prepare for sale, is that? Um, so, yes, yeah, so first yeah. thing I'd say, you're bang on. All founders, owners, entrepreneurs massively underestimate what it will take out of them in yeah. terms of, you know, part of it is just time and, and the million and one stupid questions that I ask about, you know, subcategory Z and whatever. Um, the other part of it is just emotional bandwidth. As you say, this is someone who has poured their heart and soul into a business. And even though, I mean, it's worth saying, the majority of the deals Living Bridge do, we're a minority investor. So we are just a small, taking a small ownership. So it's probably in the region of sort of 35 to 40% of the business. Um, and we're really working with you as a, as a partner to try and grow. Having said that, going from owning 100% of the business or having control over 100% to having control over you know, still a majority, but a smaller majority is, is quite an emotional process for a lot of, a lot of founders. Yeah. So, so there's that. And as you say, that's when you often find that the leadership just haven't built a team around them that can keep the plates spinning. So while the CEO and usually CEO, CFO and CTO, sometimes COO if they have one, are, you know, in meetings with people like me asking, you know, a million and one questions, someone's got to keep, keep yeah. everything going. Yeah. And you, you often get that dip in trading just after for exactly that reason. So after, a, after a sale, uh, yeah. you, you see a, what, yeah, a lot of the why? time. Why? Because they're, they're just not. Because it's the sort of lag effect of management not being 100% on focused yeah. on driving top line. Now, yeah. you know, it, we, we've done it enough times to know that's, that happens. Um, but it can often freak founders out as well because they sort of think, oh, God, it was all going so well. And then you've joined and suddenly it's soft trading. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, it'll be fine in six weeks. Yeah. So th there seems to be a huge appetite 
in PE for travel. I mean, actually, there's a number yeah. of deals that have been done PE to PE. There's people who have sold for the first time, and, and, and there seems to be um, plenty of capital out there if you're a travel business that's got the right story behind you. Yep. Maybe less so now, and, the, and on the trade side, maybe not so much. There's a few trade bars yeah. out there, but actually, you'll probably find yourself more in competition with other PE investors. What, yep. what, what is it about travel that PE likes at the moment, then? Um, so you're absolutely right. It's really, really competitive at the moment, which is why I make my comment that capital is not the scarce commodity. Um, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, you know, within the consumer sector, if you have an allocation as a private equity firm that you want to deploy in consumer, you know, retail is quite hard at the moment. Um, casual dining food has also got its own challenges. Holidays, you know, UK holiday makers are amazingly resilient to their summer holidays. So maybe it becomes a staycation, hence why, you know, Sykes Cottages is really interesting. You're seeing lots of caravan park deals going on at the moment. But, you know, there is something almost sacred about holidays that people will really hold on to that. Consumers will really hold on to that spend if they can. And so from a private equity perspective, you know, given where we are in the cycle, so it's a safe place to, to invest in comparison to some other consumer yes. segments. And it, I mean, it, it, it can change a business. I mean, I, I heard Brent Hoban speak last yep. week, I think, about um, what happened to the last minute after it became owned and he was suddenly, I think, he, I think his words were, ROI is a dreadful, dreadful thing when you yeah. want to be innovative. That's, that sounds, you know, terrible to, say, to, to think that you bring in some investors and then you, then you stop doing what you're doing. Now, whether we had a bad experience, I mean, how, how do you make sure, clearly you want return from those guys, but yep. you want them to continue to do innovative things. So how do you balance, how do you balance that? Yeah, um, well, a, a couple of things. So first of all, you need to have a really clear plan on both sides of the table of what you want out of the next, you know, five years, two years, seven years, however long you collectively decide the kind of next, next phase of what next chapter is going to be. So the more transparent you are about that, the, the less chance of kind of misalignment of interest, if you yeah, like. Yeah. Um, the second point is, you know, we want our founders to really swing for the fences. I mean, I think I touched on it with you. We, in a number of the deals we've done, both in travel and more broadly, is we actually structure our returns to say, you know, you and I have sat down and agreed a plan that you think is deliverable. But actually, if you exceed that, you get disproportionate amount of the upside. We, right. you know, we want you to take risks. We want you to push um, because that, those are the kind of businesses we back. We, we are not in the business of doing turnarounds or restructuring or, you know, there's lots of great private funds who do that. It's not us. We are in the business of, you know, backing what I call category defining brands. So people who have a really singular point of view about the purpose of their business and are really going to swing for it to get there. Yeah. Now, obviously, you've got financial controls on the other side of that. A lot of the businesses that we invest in have banking relationships and, and you know, th there's no escaping the bank. But, um, yeah, it, we definitely consider ourselves to be entrepreneurially minded and, and working with entrepreneurs yeah. to to deliver that. And often these deals come with some sort of earn out for the owner, yep. so they are looking at an exit at some point in the future. Yep. But, but you've got to keep them hungry as well to, yep. make, to make that, to make that, get, that, get to that yeah. point, haven't you? I mean, the, the biggest way to do that, and again, it's backed around to this idea of structuring and a lot of the deals we do, we're the minority, so the, the entrepreneur will still own the majority right. of the business, and there's nothing like having most of your wealth tied up in it to really focus the mind. Um, but there's also this, this piece around, um, you know, we, we deliberately encourage our entrepreneurs to try and spread the capital amongst the second tier management team. So, you know, you want your directors of countries or, you know, whatever, whatever your business model is to, to also feel like manager owners. And so Stay they the really game. drive. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, that's, that's the best way to make sure yeah. everyone's so pulling you, in the same direction. You're saying it's not, there's nothing more stifling to risk and innovation when yeah. you know everything's on the line for you personally. You know? yeah. and actually, well, so it can be a, an opener to innovation if Completely. Take, take, take. Actually, yeah, you, I mean, you raise a really good point. It sort of cuts the other way in terms of when, you, when an entrepreneur owns the business 100%, we actually find that they take less risk because they've got school fees and a mortgage and, you know, huge amount of value, but it's all tied up in this thing that they can't, you can't pay the mortgage with. Mm. So sometimes when we come in and we do a minority deal, that provides that liquidity event for that entrepreneur who can suddenly go, oh, I can pay off my mortgage, I can, you know, set my mum up for life or whatever it is and then really start to take some risk. So actually you can get that inflection point where someone says, all right, great, now I can you know, be brave and bold. And hopefully yeah. we've got the network and the experience that they can do that from a kind of really informed perspective with some people around the table who can help. 
And what's, what, what are you looking at in terms of the prospects for travel? I mean, we've got Brexit coming up, which is affecting everything, and there's a lot of uncertainty yeah. around that, of course. But actually, you know, you, you seem to be very positive about the sector and the future um, for travel. Yeah. What, 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 do you, what do you see in the near future for the, yeah, for the industry? I, I mean, I think, I think um, I'm not going to try and have a point of view on Brexit because God knows what it's going to look like. Who, yeah. I mean, who knows? It's, it's slightly pointless to try and worry about it too much. I think, again, come back to this point of if you have a great customer proposition, people, people will go with you. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in and, and looking for businesses that are, are kind of working to this theme is this idea of kind of community-led travel. So I think um, particularly with the Gen Zs and Millennials, they're really interested in how do I find like-minded people who travel with me and you know, want to do similar activities, this idea of kind of scarce and rare experiences. So yeah. you know, Airbnb is sort of dabbling in that space. You've got people like Cool Cousins doing some interesting things, but no one's yet really done it at scale. And I think there's something around some of the older, more traditional uh, sort of um, bespoke travel companies, but really leveraging more kind of community-led content and, and, and suggestion that I think is really okay. interesting. And then similarly, at the other end of the spectrum, actually, you know, when you think about where the greatest amount of wealth is in the UK, the silver pound. I mean, that's where you want to be, right? Yeah. That's why so many private equity businesses are investing in things like cruise, because it's just, it's, it's a really, really safe haven. It's, you yeah. know, yeah. they're still going to have their, their money. And so you've been knocking about out there today, yeah. I think, seeing what's going on. And see anything interesting? Or does just the sheer buzz of the place give you optimism? I mean, I think, I think the energy in that room is, is really exciting. Mm. Um, and actually, you know, all of all crises, whether, you know, Brexit is a crisis, who knows, but um, spawn innovation. People have to think creatively. People have to come up for solutions that, you know, for a problem that yet we don't even know the shape of. And actually, this is possibly an in. Ooh. Ooh. That's all right. Am I? Sorry. Um, when, you know, when you have big disruptions, you also have some of the larger players fail. And actually, in that vacuum, that creates an opportunity for some people to really step into the void. So. Yeah. Maybe it's because of where I invest in terms of at the earlier and kind of small to mid-sized growing companies. But actually, I think this is a time of great opportunity and, and I'm sure half of them are in that room. So. Yeah, well, I mean, we're in the tech zone. Yep. Obviously, there's lots of guys vending tech solutions out there. I wonder when you look at a company and you look at their technology, do you, do you, do you prefer it when they've got their own technology or is it, is it, does it, does it not, not matter as long as they're using technology in a, in a decent way or should they have something that's a bit unique um, I suppose Love Holidays was one where they built their own technology. Yeah, so Love, yeah, love, yeah, they? love Holidays, it's their own development tech stack. I mean, it's, it's all in-house. Um, I think it depends slightly where you are. Yeah. Um, I, th I think there is no shame at all in, if you know that technology is not your core competence and, and you know, there's a massive scarcity of talent out there, if you know that's not going to be where you win, focus on where you do win and just work with the best white label software kind of providers out there, there is such a plethora of white label solutions for everything. So, you know, whether it's you know, CRM management, uh, PPC uh, bidding, like everything, there, is so, there are so many great businesses who that is their core competence that you should just be working with them. And, you know, now that it's software as a solution type providers, you can refresh that every 18 months and that's how you're going to keep your edge. On the other end of the spectrum, you do have businesses that are building that proposition from a tech stack perspective. So, as you say, Love Holidays, the whole way that you go through their customer journey is predicated on the tech stack that they've built and how they, how they pull data in. So, I don't think there's one answer. I would be deeply alarmed if some businesses, and you know, I do get it, businesses who say to me, oh no, would you, you know, digital is just, just not that relevant for us. And you just think, mate, you're, you're really? about to go under a bus. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's coming. Yeah. I, I know one thing Love Holidays made a decision earlier on was they used to be part of another group for their regulatory yep. needs and all that. And it, it, that, that. That kind of nurtured them and got yeah, them yeah. to a certain level. And they decided sort of, or advised that they needed to be on their own for that kind of thing and, 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 and branch out and yeah. be reliant on somebody else. And I think there's two ways of thinking about that, because actually it's not their core competence being at all protected and bonded and that stuff. It's yeah. the boring stuff, you know, what, what they're good at is selling holidays. But what, I don't know, what's your view on that? Would, would, you, would you value them just as highly had they been still been part of another group to do that kind of functional stuff? Or do you think it, it was good that they had everything within in-house? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think clarity on your regulatory status and kind of autonomy and agency over that for me is pretty key for you to have it. I actually asked it to one of the startups that presented that was doing sort of 
um, finan the financing piece. And my first question was, you know, are you FCA registered? I, th I think, I think regulation is one where you do want to have that in-house. Um, in part because as an investor, when I invest in a business, I want to sort of have a clear edge to the group. Whenever you've got kind of codependencies on someone else, it starts to be a little bit more of a complex deal. It's not insurmountable, but it's more complex. Yeah, okay. Well, it's gone four, so I'm looking over to John. I think we need to uh, wrap things up there because there's um, a couple of questions. Good, okay. If I, I can't see anything because the lights are so bright. So, oh, there we go. There's people in the room, good. <laughs> um, hands up, there's gonna be a microphone, so please do put a hand up if you wanna ask Susie anything. Come on, there's one there. Great, well done. Hello. Hi. Uh, my question is uh, if you deal with uh, projects only in the tourist business, the sector, and the next question is what was the project that you finance uh, at the end uh, uh, that it was uh, in, its, in an its fancy? I mean, a prototype, a business idea with a prototype, yep. business venture, what? What was the... Okay, um, so the first thing to say is Living Bridge does multiple sectors. So we do uh, TMT, health and education, consumer and business services. However, we do have a pretty long track record in travel within the consumer vertical. So that answers the first question. The second question was around sort of what stage, was, is that right? Um, so as I said, we've got the three different funds. Um, most of the deals we've talked about today we're out of the middle and the larger fund, um, but we do do earlier stage investing. So out of the VCT strategy, which is sort of, as I said, making half a million to five million pound investments, that's more concept stage. However, I will caveat, we are not in the business of backing ideas, as in ideas that have not got any proof points yet. So we want to see businesses that have, you know, good momentum, proper customer engagement, ideally a cash generative, or if they're not cash generative, there's a really clear strategic decision that's been made to spend, you know, there is a really clear line of sight around it, i.e. it's not that the unit economics don't work, it's just that it's subscale or whatever. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, so you're not accelerators, let them grow the business yeah. initially, and that's where you might be interested oh, once that, yeah, okay. Um, okay, any other questions before we close this session? No, everyone's... In that case, John? Stay where you are. Stay where you are. Don't move because you will break that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, no, that's pro no problem. Thank, thank you. you. So, now I you can move. Thank you very much, we'll Susie, and, uh, thank you, Susie. Thank and you. Lee. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much. That's all right. Pleasure.